uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is, uh, firstly, he was a founder. Uh, he himself has hired a large team of uh, product folks. Uh, that is, uh, he, he's been a two-time founder. Uh, so that's where uh, his experience of uh, uh, on the hiring side comes in. He's also, uh, uh, post being a founder, he uh, also was a product lead at, uh, at Gojek. Uh, while transitioning from being a founder to becoming to becoming part of a company like Gojek, he himself has also done a lot of interview practice. So he's also been uh, somebody who has diligently followed the process as an interviewee. Uh, and uh, now he's at DoorDash. Uh, he's actually at Volt that got acquired by DoorDash uh, as a as a uh, as a product lead there. Uh, and so he's now again transitioned to being on the hiring side where he's building his team. Uh, and in addition to all of this, uh, he's also been a, uh, a uh, expert on uh, appraised. Uh, and at appraised, he's uh, interviewed more than 100 plus PMs, helping them uh, do mock interviews. So he has extensive, extensive, extensive interview uh, experience. And uh, we felt, uh, you know, in the recent uh, past, uh, the market has uh, gotten harder. A uh, few people have everyone has fewer shots uh, of becoming a product manager. Uh, it's harder to get interviews lined up. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, when you do have an interview lined up, you do the best job you can to convert that interview. Uh, and uh, uh, we've seen people making lots of the same mistakes. There are patterns in those mistakes. Uh, and that the objective of this session is actually to help you see those patterns and help you uh, avoid those mistakes. Uh, so this is uh, Gokul here. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself as well. Uh, my name is Mona and I'm the founder at Appraised. Uh, at Appraised, we're building a platform to help people uh, transition into product management. Um, <laughs> as part of that, uh, there are a couple of things we do. We have a 16-week uh, upskilling program that helps you break into product management. In addition to that, we also have another product called Prepa, which is just an interview prep product. Uh, you can uh, Google, uh, Google is actually an expert on that, uh, expert for Prepa. Uh, you can uh, sign up to get a in mock interview session with Google, uh, for example, and there's uh, 70 plus other uh, experts as well. Uh, the idea of the interview prep platform is to give you the mock interview practice you need uh, so that you have a higher shot and a better shot at, uh, at converting your real interview. <laughs> So uh, here we are. Uh, this is uh, this event is part of the uh, the appraise expert learning series. The objective with the learning series is uh, shorten your cycle of uh, learning product management. Uh, learn from others' mistakes rather than committing it yourself. Uh, that's the objective. Uh, and so here we get started. Uh, this is going to be about the topic of uh, the conversation today: is uh, how to ace your PM interviews. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, I think Gokul is probably one of the best people to talk uh, to you about that. Uh, so Gokul, uh, firstly, I want to kind of get your perspective on, uh, uh, on uh, as a hiring manager, what are the skills you look for uh, in a PM and how do you evaluate them? Uh, thanks, Mona. Thanks for the elaborate and, and great intro. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, coming to your uh, question, I think there are obviously two uh, kinds of skills uh, that are that are there. There are the hard skills and then there are the soft skills. Uh, hard skills include: uh, Hey, can you given an abstract problem statement? Uh, are you able to think through uh, levers that sort of are relevant to the uh, problem statement? Like, are you able to identify uh, interesting customer uh, segments? Are you able to uh, find? Uh, pain points that others don't necessarily think of. Uh, are you able to think at a higher level and say, hey, from a business point of view, uh, this makes sense. Um, and then this is what's the long-term uh, advantage or mode for this business. Are you able to think of these levers? Uh, are you able to think in terms of numbers, in terms of data? Uh, are you able to think in terms of systems? Uh, when, it, when you talk about product management, it's, it's essentially a system. You are trying to let the business run uh, and the business in itself is a complex system involving mm. legal marketing, all of these things. I am able to think about the system uh, and the soft skills uh, are not just, uh, you know, uh, how you communicate, like uh, how authentic you are, but also about uh, some of the subjective elements. Like uh, it's very hard to be a product manager if you don't have or exhibit good taste. Mm. Uh, uh, like there is, there is a, there is a element of art 
to product management, which often gets overlooked. And uh, uh, because product management is like a very sexy sort of career choice today, uh, it is attracting a lot of these uh, careerists, uh, like people who just want to like be a product management because it's a good career option. Like that's that's a uh, yeah. the, uh, it's it's easy to weed out uh, people who don't really love the craft, who don't really like, mm. like going into the details and stuff like that. Uh, I like sussing them out in in the softer aspects uh, when when I interview people. Mm. Got it. Uh, so, you know, uh, you are uh, a, a, just as one of the things I think I kind of missed out on uh, mentioning is you're one of those folks uh, who has also transitioned from uh, being uh, a product manager in India to being a product manager uh, internationally uh, at an MNC, right? Um, have you seen any differences in uh, both the skill requirement as well as the evaluation uh, or emphasis on different skills? Um, uh, when you try to hire product managers in India versus hire product managers abroad? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, so for those of you who don't have the context, I'm based in Berlin. Uh, uh, I mean, where I'm working at Bolt. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, the European or the international companies that I have interviewed at uh, place a lot more emphasis on uh, collaborative problem solving uh, and then the culture aspects of it. Uh, like, can you really, really uh, get things done without exercising authority? Uh, and even though technically PM is a role that does not uh, have authority, it can only influence. Uh, in India, you're still able to sort of exercise some level of authority saying, hey, get this done. Uh, that that will never work in, in a setting like Europe where it's all like very collaborative. And that's that that emphasis I've seen a lot more interviewing internationally than in India. Interesting. Have you also seen a difference in uh, uh, the expectation from a PM when it comes to a startup versus a large company? Uh, definitely. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I have never done a, uh, worked at a series B, series C uh, startup. I've either like done zero to one small scale startups uh, where I was like hiring for people or I've uh, worked at large scale companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, part of the uh, difference in expectation is uh, uh, in, um, in, a, in a startup, you're expected to uh, be very scrappy and get shit done really quickly with, with, with a lot of constraints. Uh, like you should be really good at like street smart experimentation, like uh, doing very nimble, very scrappy stuff. Uh, at a large org, uh, the process and alignment and, you know, uh, you know, working with stakeholders, uh, making sure that everyone is on the same page and things are moving at, you know, at a reasonable pace. Um, and, and that there is a coherent sort of uh, strategy that, that flows top down. Uh, and your initiatives make sense um, and you're able to like generate the level of visibility for your team. Mm. Uh, these things matter a lot more. That is organizational dynamics as such matters a lot more in, in large odds uh, than, in a, than in a startup. So mm. Volt is very beautifully in, in, in on the cusp of becoming a large org. That's still mm. very much a startup. Mm. Uh, so I'm seeing like uh, this is a very interesting experience for me for I have to do uh, very like I was literally responding to a Slack message where we are running a very simple operational experiment in one of the cities that old operates in uh, on top of intercom. It's for mm. a product that we will eventually build in like three months. Uh, but it, you would never do something like this at Google, like where you have mm. like a team of lawyers, you know, yeah, designers, engineers who are all deciding what you have to build. Got it. Understood. What are some of the hard skills and the soft skills? You talked about both of this and you talked about how some part of it is art and some part of it is science. Um, if you had to kind of uh, break the art and science into uh, what kind of hard skills and soft skills are you tested on? Uh, how, would you, how would you break that uh, down? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it, I, I briefly touched upon this in, in a blog post uh, that I actually wrote for a priest as well, uh, yeah. where uh, when it comes to hard skills, see, all interview loops, when you're talking about interviews, all interview loops are standard, right? Uh, mm. there, there's not too much of a difference. Mm. Uh, when it comes to hard skills, there are two or three areas. Uh, depending on your level of seniority, uh, you're tested on strategy or not. Mm. Uh, like questions like, hey, your Airbnb, COVID-19 has hit. What would you do mm. as a company? Mm. Uh, things like this. Uh, then you have product design, uh, uh, which is like design 
an abstract product, whatever mm. books for children or whatever. Uh, then you have uh, metrics and mm. uh, data related questions like you are the PM on Instagram. What are the top five metrics that you care mm. about? Uh, or RCA, like you're a PM at YouTube, views have dropped by 8%. What, 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 what mm. do you think would be the cost? Uh, and then uh, execution sort of questions, like uh, how would you design an A-B test uh, mm. to measure something uh, and all these kinds of stuff, prioritization. Uh, mm. So prioritization is a thing between soft and hard because mm. it also like involves stakeholder management, like getting inputs and all that. Uh, and then when you come to soft skills, you have behavioral questions, historical projects. Uh, your your like I said, I really test for taste. Uh, mm. So like I love questions around uh, uh, what is your what is your favorite uh, product? And uh, if it, it may sound like a very cliched question, mm. but uh, uh, the the uh, depth to which someone goes and analyzes products uh, yeah. comes through very much in these kinds of questions. And I add a twist like saying, what is your favorite non-tech product? Uh, mm. And uh, uh, the, the, these kinds of like uh, personal preferences. Why do you want to be a PM? Uh, what are your motivations? Especially if someone is making a shift from another industry to product management uh, and uh, uh, things like uh, things that bring out uh, humility, uh, ability to accept failures, uh, you know, uh, how you sort of like lead a team. Uh, these kinds of stuff uh, are, are some of the softer elements that are tested. Got it. You know, one of the common, uh, the most common questions we get is, um, uh, you know, I have an interview lined up. Uh, the interview is like three or four days away. Uh, and uh, the, you know, what are the things, what are some things we should prep for, right? Uh, firstly, the duration between somebody getting a confirmed interview and somebody having that interview is typically two to three day window, right? Uh, and the general approach is uh, people try to boil the ocean. They try to learn everything in those three, four days. Um, uh, how do you prioritize where to focus your time uh, between in that short duration? Sure. Uh, so I think I have, I have a bit of a, it may not answer your question, uh, but yeah. I, have a, I have a bit of an answer to this. It's that you should never apply or like get to that point where you're actually having interviews uh, until you're prepared. Uh, like there are, there are, so, the first thing that people need to remember about interviews is that it's not a measure of skill. It's a measure of preparedness. Uh, uh, like it, it's, it's, it's a game uh, that you're playing in order to like crack, uh, so unlock some, some access. Right. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to measure someone's skill. And uh, uh, therefore like people test you on the spot with like abstract questions and all that. Uh, but it's something that you can practice mm. and you should never go to an interview uh, without at least at least three weeks of practice uh, and the way I used to structure it was uh, I'd have like three four weeks of mock interviews and uh, then I'd do something called throwaway interviews uh, which is like companies I know I'm not going to join uh, but I want to like get get the get in the interview sort of groove uh, this I do like three or four interviews and then I would uh, start my interviews for the actually interesting companies. Uh, so, uh, you, you, I, I mean, at one at the point where you are actually interviewing for the uh, company that you want to join, uh, it's no longer an interview. It's one of those mock interviews that you're doing. Like, so it becomes so sort of like part of your uh, this thing. And within the interview itself, interview prep itself, there are two things that you must deliver uh, that you must focus on. One is the content. Uh, uh, what what are you actually saying? Uh, like, uh, are you making the right arguments? Like if you're asked an abstract strategy question, like should Google get into uh, ride sharing? <coughs> Sorry, let's say this is a strategy question. Uh, are you making the, are you making a coherent argument or on should they or shouldn't they? And the second part is actually delivery. How are you saying this? So uh, especially as you, become a product manager uh, you're expected to be excellent at communication like uh, there is there is a there is a blog post by uh, andrew bosworth uh, mm. who's the i think he's now the cto of uh, facebook yes. uh, and uh, he replaced mike Stroff, if i'm not wrong uh, uh, he has a blog post titled communication is the job uh, and i think it applies more so to product managers so how you deliver something is very, very, very critical. 
And so I spend at least like 10 mock interviews just refining my delivery. Uh, am I taking unnecessary pauses? Am I uh, am I not coming off as someone who who would be like, uh, you know, if, if I were not doing this, I should be Ben Thompson writing strategy articles. Like that's how <laughs> coherent I, sh- I should be. Uh, yeah, but how do you, uh, so, go, uh, so Google, I have a question, you know, uh, points noted, <coughs> like you have to, you have to know whether you're doing well on your mock interviews or not. Um, but most people uh, do interview practice by themselves, right? Uh, they look at a question and they, they try to think about the answer. How do you <coughs> figure out that you are doing well or not doing well? Like, right. So this is where mock interviews really come in handy. Uh, I think number one, uh, most people what they do is they tend to go to uh, PM interview question websites, try to look up the answers, and then say, yeah, the, I would have thought of this. And but mm. but when you are actually on the spot. Yeah. You can't think of it, right? Um, So the goal is to put uh, yourself in the spot when the stakes are very low. uh, That you can do in a mock interview. And if I were interviewing today uh, for a role, I would do no less than 70 to 80 mock interviews. Um, And and, uh, uh, I I find it mind-boggling that people go to interviews without... Uh, doing even a single mock interview and uh, uh, there was another part to your earlier question like how do they approach uh, uh, this thing Uh, so I would so I used to write down answers I actually like I was looking at my iPad just before this thing and there was like a 135 page notebook uh, on my good notes that basically had written answers to uh, questions Uh, so first prep on your own nail the content uh, then go to mock interviews uh, to sort of like know where you're failing in the content and in the delivery and thinking on the spot. And then like as you do more and more mock interviews, you sort of get get better. And there are like ton of uh, you know uh, avenues to to do mock interviews, including uh, prepa, uh, which which I think which I think is really really helpful. Yeah, uh, I just want to highlight one point. Uh, I think a lot of people think uh, that. Uh, once you're a founder, once you're at a decent company, uh, you can wing the product interview. You can just line something up and just show up there. I just want to highlight that uh, people that have uh, had step function change in their careers uh, have definitely all done mock interview practice. Uh, and I also want to highlight that um, in my experience, um, uh, you should have uh, you should have more pride than shame in doing mock interviews. Uh, it's not a signal of you not knowing your subject. It's actually a signal of how seriously you're taking the next opportunity. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, when I first spoke to Google, which was, I think, almost three years ago, uh, I uh, had reached out to him to try to understand, uh, you know, how he did mock interview practice and what helped him uh, crack the product interview. Uh, and he mentioned something very interesting, which is um, he talked about uh, the amount of effort he had put into mock interviews, which he just highlighted right now. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I'd like to get the get access to that 135 page notebook. I think it will be a goldmine of uh, goldmine of uh, information. But uh, the amount of effort he put in <clears throat> was stellar. And I think uh, uh, at some point in the discussion, he even talked about. Uh, because of all the effort that he had put in, he'd actually uh, spent some time on refining the circles framework uh, to edit it a little bit to think about, uh, you know, the, the depth of the problem statement when it comes to product design questions. Uh, so I want to talk to you, Gokul, about that. Uh, how did you come to that a more, slightly modified version of the circles framework? And uh, the framework actually is described in the link that I just shared with you guys uh, on Appraise, uh, the blog that he wrote. Uh, you can you guys can read the slightly updated version of circles. Uh, what was your thought process behind it? Uh, how did you refine it? Uh, and what does that framework actually uh, uh, you know what are the areas of refinement? Right. Uh, so uh, circles is obviously like the first thing that anyone sees like when they search yeah. for them, interview prep or whatever. Uh, but I very quickly realized that it, it doesn't work, right? Uh, and I, and I, and uh, the place I realized it doesn't work is actually like a very weird sort of thing. So I don't even know if you know Mona, but uh, uh, actually the first, very first real interview, PM interview that I had was with Google. Mm. Uh, so I I reached out to a friend, she referred me to Google and uh, I was going through the interview process. And uh, 
I got asked a very sort of interesting uh, question, uh, uh, which said, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, design a voice assistant for children, right? Mm. Uh, and I realized uh, there are there are so many assumptions that circles makes that you would answer like it, yes. it makes an assumption that you would think about it but you actually don't like uh first it says clarify assumptions which is great uh and then it says uh uh identify uh uh i, I identify something like uh tar target users and pain points yes. uh but it doesn't tell you that you have to uh, how to think about target users, how to sort of like, uh, uh, you know, why you should pick one target user to go after. Uh, and what does describing pain points mean? There are actually two ways to describing pain points. One, you can think about uh, the goals of the user, the needs that yeah. they have when they want to do this product. And in many cases, they are actually replacing another product uh, yes. with this which means like you have to describe that user journey as well. Uh, and then you have to sort of converge on like, what is the current user journey? What are the needs? Where is the gap? This is your problem space, right? Uh, and then you're actually supposed to prioritize among the, these, mm. uh, you know, problem statements and say, I'm going to pick one, I'm going to pick two, I'm going to pick three. Uh, and I realized circles like had a lot of gaps uh, in this, uh, in this flow. Uh, and and uh, that's what prompted me to come up with what's called uh, Sidal Dosi. Uh, it's a uh, freaking stupid uh, acronym, but but, <laughs> uh, but but it uh, works. It works. Yeah, it works. So uh, and I realized that you know when I was start when I started. So this is the part about like refining the content. Like when I started writing answers, uh, and and I I I bungled my Google interview mostly because of that that mm -hmm. question. Right. Uh, and Google places a lot of emphasis on product design questions. Uh, I, I realized that uh, once you sort of like go through this flow, uh, you no longer have to worry about the structure. You actually have to worry only about the content. And then I started strengthening my content and then then things happen. They started happening magically. Uh, this is the genesis of uh, Sidal Dosi. I, I, I realized that Circles has a lot of contextual gaps. It assumes you will do something, but it doesn't tell you that you're supposed to do it. Um, and that's why I came up with the custom framework. Awesome. Um... You know, one of the other questions we get for interview prep, uh, which is very commonly asked is, um, I obviously cannot uh, practice uh, and focus on every skill because some skills I'm good at, some skills I'm not good at. Uh, same for hard skills, same for soft skills, uh, same question. Uh, how do I know where to focus? How do I know where to get started? Like, what should I, what should, like you said, you should do 30 mock interviews before you even kind of get to the first interview, right? Yeah, so uh, I think it's very natural to feel that, uh, you know, I'm good at this, I'm not good at this. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you sort of have a rigorous process for how we are approaching prep in the first place, uh, you will get to like 80, 90% good on all the skills. Uh, but first, I, I would recommend, uh, so you can, you can say for sure that there is no PM hiring loop without a design and a data RCA mm. kind of question. Um, so again, I'd, I'd look at, uh, you know, like like a PM prioritizing it, I'd look at like a rice <laughs> over and say like the, the probability of me getting a product design question is very high. So yes. let me nail this. Um, yeah. And then data question again is very high. Uh, I'll nail these uh, yeah. most commonly asked first <clears throat> before going into something like, strategy which usually starts appearing only at senior levels and yeah. uh, uh, execution questions again only happens when you're already a product manager um, yes. uh, job uh, job hopping or something like that uh, so cover the fundamentals first which is product design metrics rca uh, then go into high uh, things like uh, behavioral uh, introduction tell me about yourself like the, the amount of candidates i have to like I, I I get an I do a no on my mind because they bungle they tell me about yourself is mind blowing. Yes. <laughs> uh tell me a little bit more about uh, uh you know your tips on how to describe yourself. Like you said, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh seems like the most simple question to ask. Uh it seems like you should be able to tell your story. Uh, but most people uh you know kill their shot in that first phone screen with the HR uh, when they have to answer this question. Yeah. Uh, so what, is, 
yeah so the thing is it's not going to be with just the hr it's going to be literally the first question you answer with any uh, interviewer on the panel uh, pretty much yes. every conversation is going to start with hey what's your background like right yes. uh, and i used to be terrible at this uh, until someone dalan uh, pointed out to me and said you're taking too long and then i'm like mm-hmm. okay i'm going to refine it uh, and uh, so i started writing so i'll tell you how most people screw this up uh it's uh by having bullet points in their head uh that they expand in real time uh they have like they have things like i need to talk about this i need to talk about this i need to talk about this but it's actually a script that you're supposed to say without coming off as robotic and this script should be rehearsed to perfection mm. and the way i do it is uh i first talk about like who i am what i'm doing right now uh so this sort of gives them like okay this is this guy's background mm. because most people don't read the resume before they come to the uh, yes. interview right as as a as a hiring manager i'm guilty of it uh mm. i don't i don't read all int- resumes before i get to the interview yeah. so i don't even know what this guy is doing today uh so that sort of gives an anchoring point it's the z right and then i jump immediately and say uh i started off as a founder blah 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 i was in this college which is my a and then i map a journey from a to z saying like from then on i went to this and then i went to this currently i'm here and for the next 2 3 years i plan to work on abc problem areas which is where this company or this opportunity fits in and then say i outside of work i do a, uh, i i like to do xyz so you have presented your entire story and you started off with z and then start off with a and then drew that map from mm. a to z and you also said what your goals are which means uh, people know uh, why you are working interviewing with this company and like uh, because the next obvious question is going to be like why this company and you have already answered yeah. that uh, so i think i think this this works as a tell me about yourself sort of uh, question or uh, formula but but again like there may be other things that that i am not sure of Rahul has an interesting question. Uh, he said he's heard this advice from few folks that whenever asked this question about tell me a little bit about yourself, they uh, ask the interview to tell a little bit about the role and then answer it by customize it accordingly. Uh, is this a good approach or does it feel rude? Yeah, I think it's a, it feels a bit rude to me as well because you're not answering the question. Like if yeah. I were an hiring manager, it's like I'm the one yes. asking asking the question. Like so, uh, I wouldn't do this. Yeah, and I also agree with uh, Devajyoti, which is if you are interviewing there, you should already know the role. Um, yeah, exactly. That's also a sign that you probably haven't done enough research about the company or the role that you're working at, that you're interviewing for. Um. Uh. So, uh, you know, as you said, you kind of refined this, you know, story about yourself, uh, and now you've kind of gotten it right. Uh, what are some ways, uh, tactical ways, uh, people can go about? uh do you have tips on how people can go about writing this themselves right. and scripting so like i said uh the z like what are you doing right now succinctly yeah. capture uh what your current role is what you're doing today okay. and say like so when i was interviewing at volt i'd i'd say uh i'm i'm a product manager at gojek where i'm responsible for leading a part of the consumer platform team mm. uh, gojek is a 10 billion dollar unicorn in right hearing transport mm. sorry right hearing uh, food delivery and uh, payment mm. services um, and uh, i am specifically responsible for the reliability of uh, and the experiences reliability of uh, uh, communication services at gojek and the experiences users have when they use them uh, so this sort of like captures whatever i was trying to do at gojek without going too much into uh, detail and then i say i started off as a uh, I, i started my journey in technology uh, as a founder uh when i was still in college uh and uh, uh i i started a interest based social network um and uh it which didn't really work out uh, and then we pivoted into a media technology company because we had built a lot of nlp capabilities um mm. after 6 years of about uh, running it i realized uh, uh i was uh, you know losing uh, energy and we didn't hit that hockey stick growth curve uh and so i transitioned to this role at gojek which i am in so i have a total of about 6 years of industry experience mm. uh and for the next 5 years i want to work at a company which is slightly smaller than gojek uh where i can come in and shape the product processes and stuff like that and volt feels like a very natural fit for this 
uh, and uh, that's why I'm having this conversation. Uh, and outside of work, I really love going on long drives with my wife and our dog. Uh, and, uh, you know, like we live in Bangalore uh, and I love reading a lot. So I've given the interviewer two or three conversation starters. Uh, what do you like to read? Um, you know, uh, what kind of dog do you have? Uh, and uh, uh, what do you mean by shaping the culture and stuff like that? So uh, this becomes a segue into more conversations. This is great. Uh, but I think one of the most common struggles is for people that don't have any product experience, right? Uh, they're very early in their career. They're very, like, they don't have much to share about work, for example. Uh, so if it was a younger Gokul, how would you do it? Yeah. So younger Gokul, what he did was, uh, he basically, uh, so when I was interviewing uh, for, for Gojek, for example, I had no prior product experience. Yes. Right? I had experience as a founder. So what I would do is uh, I'd position whatever I've done as what a product role demands. Like, uh, for example, I'd say, I've been responsible for uh, handling investor relations, uh, mm. sketching out product wireframes and mocks, doing user research. Uh, I've also been involved in uh, uh, writing pseudo code for my engineers. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the key is obviously you have to have done something interesting, right? It's, mm. it's, it's up to you to sort of bring it up and convert it into a story. It could be, uh, you know, I, I, I remember uh, uh, someone uh, who I interviewed on Prepa uh, who talked about uh, their volunteering experience where they worked with government stakeholders and stuff. Mm. And my immediate thought was, okay, this guy has worked with a lot of interesting, sort of very difficult to manage stakeholders. And, yeah. and that's a good sort of signal for, for product management. So uh, figure out what the role demands, which is creativity, out of the box thinking, structured thinking, uh, ability to prioritize, uh, managing projects uh, and initiatives, yes. managing people, managing stakeholders, influencing, mm. leading people who don't report to you, who, do, who you don't have authority over. Um, these are what the role encompasses. If you have life or if you have career moments that where you've done this, I would sort of gently surface this in the in the intro and sort of sketch that narrative. Got it. Um, we, uh, you know, at Appraised, uh, we have obviously as a career transition platform, we have lots of folks uh, that are uh, jumping into product management for the first time. And one of the key things we always tell them is uh, it's important to, uh, you know, nobody can tell your story better than you can. Right. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it's like a cover of a book. Uh, if you can't, if you can't get someone interested to hear you for the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, you've already kind of lost half your battle because the person is just trying to understand who you are as an individual. Uh, most people uh, that have previous product management experience, the interviewer goes in with a bias that he knows what product management is. I just need to check whether he'll be a good product manager. But for people that don't have prior product management experience, the interviewer goes in with the bias that he doesn't actually know any product management and maybe he's an exception. Uh, so he's giving you that chance to see whether you are that exception or not. And so you have to work harder to prove yourself. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, like you said, uh, it's, uh, it's shocking how many people uh, just strip on this simple question of tell me a little bit about yourself. And uh, the pointers you gave are uh, actually very, very similar to what we also tell people start with, you know, where you are today, uh, start with your starting point and then bridge that journey uh, and then highlight, uh, you know, what are some key things that are unique about you, right? That may be conversation starters. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, writing a script, um, uh, is actually directly proportional to their own communication skills. So if they were already good at communication, maybe they probably don't, uh, the script helps in just synthesizing and making it more succinct, but most people actually just even struggle with, uh, with creating that script in the first place. Right. Um, and, um, uh, we often find that, uh, in the absence of that, uh, when you don't have, uh, maybe your communication is probably, uh, is good, but it's not the best. Um, that taking help from friends or family that can highlight some things that you probably think are not as critical to showcase or talk about is, is very important. Uh, and we've been encouraging, uh, folks to do that. Um, do you have any, do you have any tips on sort of how to ask for that help from your friends? Um, uh, because there's also this sense of peer pressure, you know, like 
it feels like I don't want to make myself look stupid in front of my friends or like my family. Like, how do you ask for that help? Uh, maybe that could also, uh, yeah, if you have any sure. thoughts on that. <clears throat> sure. Uh, so number one, I think there there will definitely be like a few product managers or mm. product people in your circles. I would go to them. Yeah. And uh, uh, I would I would do that. Uh, exercise of like going through the entire mock interview actually with them. Uh, my friends do it with me. I do it with my friends. Mm. Uh, actually, Dalan, who I mentioned, who is now a I think senior PM at Microsoft. Uh, uh, he he did my first ever mock interview, mm. uh, and um, that's when I realized you know if you're screwing up at the in the mock interview, you are very likely to screw up in the real interview yes. because the stakes are yes. higher. And yeah. that's when I started taking mock interviews seriously. Uh, I think you should do that. Uh, people who are very close to you, who know you pretty well and see, uh, and are able to point out, hey, you're missing this element about yourself that could actually be very relevant. Uh, and I also think it's very hard to get it right uh, the first time. Uh, I think uh, I, I consider myself pretty decent at communication and, and uh, I had to like, uh, go through like at least three or four iterations before I arrived at this framework. Like today, there is a praise you are advising people. When I was doing my first tell me about yourself, there was no one to teach me <laughs> go the A to Z bridging. Uh, but uh, and and the way I used to do it was I used to literally record uh, myself telling me about myself and listening it, listening to it myself. And then I'd be like, "Ha, huh, this is very robotic." Or this is like I'm taking a lot of pauses here and. I, I still have those like 40, 50 recordings of me mm. doing a tell me about yourself for myself. Uh, mm. And then like you sort of, okay, here's where I need to place emphasis. This is what I need to, uh, you know, uh, highlight or this is too verbose. It's not needed. Uh, all of these editing you do and then you arrive at that script and then you practice that script for another 30, 40 times till you actually, mm -hmm. uh, actually follow a script, but don't sound robotic. Got it. Um, I have one last question. I will open it up for uh, folks. Um, you know, uh, we've also seen so two common tripping points. Uh, first is tell me a little bit about yourself. That is one common area that people trip. The second is, uh, let's say they've done mock interview practice. They actually do well on the design questions. They do well on the metric questions. Uh, but then they get to the last round, which is typically the culture fit round, right? And uh, uh, they don't know how to prep because they don't know what it means to prep for culture fit. Uh, do you have any insights on that? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, uh, different companies have different types of doing this culture fit rounds. Like you either have like a bar racer round, which is uh, which is famous at Amazon or, or yes. Gojek for that matter. Uh, and Google tests across uh, you know, uh, across functions, across interviews, uh, they test for this factor called Googliness, uh, mm. which is intellectual humility, out of the box thinking, yeah. uh, ability to own your failures and all of these things. So uh, there are two or three ways to prep for this. One is uh, uh, actually being your most authentic self, uh, number one. Uh, most people try to, you know, uh, cook up a story and, you know, try to be fake. Uh, and experienced interviewers will always see through this and the people they put yes. in these bar racer rounds are probably the most experienced people at the company uh, and uh, uh, being authentic is, is very key uh, and understanding what the uh, company so usually culture fit rounds are like why do you want to join here like what makes you what makes you think Yes. Uh, you will be a good fit for uh, this thing. What makes I actually ask? I'm I'm in these final rounds these days, so yeah. uh, I, I ask people like, why shouldn't I hire you? Like, what ma what what makes you a bad PM, right? Yeah. Uh, like people are good companies are looking for the self awareness uh, yes. and and you know ability to own your failures and all that. Uh, there are two three ways to prep for this. One, uh, have your reasons for why this company very, very clear. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to actually research about the company. You need to know where you are in your career and why this is the right move for you. Like this clarity of thought is very, very important. Like for example, when I was joining Gojek, I had uh, two or three agendas. One was creating impact at scale. Uh, two was learning methodical product management. Uh, and uh, the third was, uh, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't remember the third thing, sorry. Uh, but yeah, like these two things, I say I am able to map with where Gojek is right now, 
where I am in my career and why Gojek is a good fit. And uh, uh, why Gojek in the first place? Why not say XYZ company? Uh, I researched about what is Gojek's market share in Indonesia. I found that Indonesia has, a, has twice the per capita GDP of India, twice or thrice. Uh, and like how the internet market in, in uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asia is like exploding uh, and why Gojek is positioned to grow uh, and all that. And that it also ties to my personal goal saying create impact at scale. You're doing 120 million dollars a month. Uh, this is this is insane scale and all that. So you need to have researched about the company, about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and you also need to be like very humble about why we shouldn't mm -hmm. hire you. Like, for example, uh, uh, at Gojek, I think I remember being asked this question by someone uh, where they said, uh, like, uh, what are some reasons why you think you would not be a good fit at Gojek? Mm. I said, I've never worked in a distributed team. I've never worked in a big organization. Uh, uh, forget any, uh, forget big organization. I've never worked yeah. in any organization. I don't know uh, middle management dynamics and mm. all that. So uh, this kind of like honesty, self-awareness, uh, research about the company, research about the role, figuring out where you are, figuring out what the company mm. is about, why you are a good fit. Uh, these are things that you should have done. And this is what people expect in Culture Fit Rounds. Awesome. Uh, all right. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to actually unmute folks uh, that I have posted questions here. You guys can ask a question yourself. Uh, uh, unmuting. Um, uh, unmuting. Mahendra. Can you guys raise your hands if you have questions? It makes it easy to unmute. Uh, Mahindra's question is, uh, is the culture fit around the best time to discuss slash understand the product culture in the hiring company or should we try to have that discussion early in the process? I think uh, it's a discussion that you should A, have figured out even before you apply uh, mm. by talking to people, like sussing out what the company is about and all that. Uh, and B, I like asking a variant of this question mm -hmm. when they say, do you have any questions for us? Uh, mm -hmm. I ask them, what do they love the most about being a product manager at the company? What do they hate the most? Uh, these two sort of give me whatever I need to know yeah. about the product culture. Nice. Uh, Sayed, unmuting you. Yeah, hi Gokul. Um, we've had a interview before in Upraised. So you're the one, uh, one of the few who gave me a yes for my interview process. But uh, thank, thanks for that. But keeping that in mind, um, my question here is, um, since that it's been at least two, three months now for that, I still feel like I haven't learned enough and I still have that imposter syndrome, you can say. So how do you deal with that? And what, what can you do to make sure that you build that confidence? Yeah, uh, imposter syndrome is very real. Uh, I struggle with it uh, till date. I, I, I mean, it's not impo It's not imposter syndrome if you think it's imposter syndrome, right? Like, uh, you could, you <laughs> yes. could be really dumb. Right? Like, that's what I tell myself. It's not imposter syndrome if you're really an idiot. That's what I tell myself. But uh, all kidding aside, I think uh, uh, when it comes to interviews, uh, the way to get over this imposter syndrome is to do so many mocks that at one point it becomes a mechanical drill. Like, uh, like when I went to, uh, like my favorite uh, thing with mock interviews and like my experience interviewing at Gojek, uh, Gojek is a very hard place to get into. And uh, I was very nervous, uh, but I realized that uh, my nervousness did not impact my performance at all. Like I knew that it would sort of like, once thrown a, I'm thrown a question, I knew like, uh, all levers would sort of crank in and the answers would start coming. And before, on my way to Gojek's office, uh, I was able to predict, uh, for example, in the data round, this is the sequence of questions that they would ask. Uh, this is what they would ask and this is the sequence in which they would ask. And it ended up being that uh, in reality. So uh, I think there is a point in, in doing mock interviews where you basically get to that mechanical level of precision where you're just operating you're not you're mm -hmm. no longer answering questions you're just operating as a machine awesome uh debyajit had asked uh, debyajyoti had asked a question before uh, she had two questions apart from the mindset to approach problems and thinking about solutions in a more structured way what changes when you when you start as a pm uh, and now 
Uh, second question was how much of your day do you spend writing specs versus working with design tech and other stakeholders versus doing other activities? Right. Uh, what What do you mean by what changes when you start as a PM and now? Uh, I don't follow that part. I think if you want a PM before uh, and you become a PM, I think her question is obviously the mindset changes because you have to approach problems and th think about solutions in a more structured way. Uh, this is even But outside room. of that, is there any other change? Yeah, yeah. Is it in the role or in the interview? In the role, I think. In the role, yeah. I think uh, one thing that... that uh, uh, you realize after you become a PM when you haven't been is that uh, uh, you you should spend a lot of time with the problem as opposed to the solution. Like doing the design, doing the engineering is very, very easy. Uh, but if you are working on the wrong problem in the first place or if you have not understood what the problem is in the first place, uh, then your product is doomed to fail. Uh, and there, there is this old English proverb which I think is... Uh, uh, very applicable for product management, uh, which is measured with a micrometer cut with an axe. Uh, and uh, uh, like that's that's essentially been my approach to product management where uh, I spend like, uh, so this, this operational experiment that I was talking about uh, that we are running where the product will come in a few months. Uh, I've actually been thinking about the problem since like last December. Uh, and and there have been solutions thrown, uh, but you should stay above the noise and say, you know what, I don't think this is the right solution. Um, and we don't know the problem well enough before you sort of like go into the solution mode. That's been a big, big sort of mindset uh, shift. Uh, and now I spend like 70% of the time on understanding the problem, researching, looking at data, uh, questioning myself uh, before committing to a solution. Uh, and to answer your second question, uh, I actually have moved a uh, little bit beyond writing specs or, um, you know, working direct. I do work with designers. I do work with engineers. Uh, but today my, my uh, leverage is mostly at, you know, at more at a strategy level where I say, uh, hey, I think in order to win in the next one year in this country, we should focus on ABC uh, levers and then uh, they, I, I, I don't have a full-fledged team yet. I do have a team uh, and, and they execute and I work with the CPO. I work with uh, my director of product uh, who all sort of, we, we work more at the strategy level than at an execution level today. Uh, but yes, I do do some level of execution. Mm. Got it. Cool. Uh, we have a few questions actually coming in from YouTube as well, uh, whether where we're streaming at live. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, how did you cut down or add some habits over the years to improve your productivity uh, whole day while managing teams? And how do you overcome interview anxiety? These are the two questions. Right. So what is the first question? Could you repeat that? Uh, the first question is, how do you become more productive during your day? Like, how do you better manage your time? I think it's prep. Uh, I spend uh, three, four hours every Sunday evening to sort of like map out my entire week. Uh, mm. And I, I literally have a document that where the top section is key outcomes I would have, I need to have covered by the end. I, I need to have achieved by the end of the week. Uh, mm -hmm. And it can be something like as simple as like write the spec or make sure this goes live. Uh, and then like in order to achieve that, I need to do ABC. Um, I, 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 I'm a big fan of this framework called GTD, getting things done. Uh, yeah. Pretty much everyone who has done, re ever read a personal productivity book has read yes. of get, getting things done, but nobody really applies it. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's how I manage my time. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the second question. How do you overcome interview anxiety? Uh, mock interviews like there, there there is really no other answer like you yes there is no shortcut guys there's no, there shortcut, is no shortcut you do 60 yes. I, I remember someone telling me like i was bullshitting when i said like uh 40 plus mock interviews you should not walk into an interview without 40 plus mock interviews but it's real like uh you should not you you should you should spend at least you should do at least five to six mock interviews a day for three to four weeks before you do a real interview yes uh, Tanishka, unmuting you, maybe you can ask a question. Hi, Mona. First of all, thank you so much for asking, you know, really great questions, I would say. And uh, that got us through the basics and Gokul uh, really taking us through the ground level up. So that was really helpful. Uh, my question revolves around uh, the circle framework and the SIDAL dossier. If I'm 
pronouncing it correctly i'm not sure so i've heard this for the first time if you can lay a bit of more emphasis on uh, you know briefly touch base on the circle framework and cdl to see that would be really helpful for people like us who have not come across this word till now but it will be a great learning for us so yeah have you not come across circles or have you not come across cdl to see i would say both okay um, then uh, so if you do any level of pm prep uh, you look at any kind of PM interview books, cracking the PM interview, decode and conquer, uh, 164 questions by Lewis Lynn, whatever, you will find circles, uh, which is basically an approach to answering product design questions, like design a, uh, design a bookshelf for children, <coughs> or like I mentioned earlier, design a voice assistant for, for children. So these questions are usually in the format of... <coughs> How would you design X or how would you design X for Y or how would you redesign X? Uh, these are the three kinds of uh, uh, design questions. Um, and Circles asks you to clarify uh, assumptions, then identify, the, I forgot what Circles stands for uh, really, uh, but it basically tells you to identify user segments and like pain points. Uh, uh, something uh, list requirements like identify solution, eliminate uh, uh, solutions, or summarize whatever. Some something like that. Uh, you can look it up online. Uh, sure. Circles is a very common product design framework. Uh, Sidal Dosi is a <coughs> custom framework that I came up with, uh, which is basically an expansion of Circles. Wherever Circles had gaps, I just added more alphabets and said, "This is what makes sense." <coughs> So if you know circles uh, and you read about Sudal Dosi in the blog post, uh, you will understand what both mean and what the differences are. Awesome. Unmuting uh, Divya. Hi, Divya. Hi, Hi. Hi Vola. Yeah. So um, yes, all of the questions which you already <coughs> have given us a quite good ground from how to start and where to start and where all we were lacking. So the question for now today is um, how to answer a question when we are knowing that we're not knowing the answer. So example, I would say that uh, once I was getting interviewed for a trip booking company. Um, so it asked me that, will it be a good product if we launch a product specifically for senior citizens to book only trip for Char Dham Yatras? So now that will require some basic data whether uh, they are really in place to go there or not, whether they are um, uh, physically fit to go there or not, or who is actually paying for them, their children or they themselves. So how would we uh, answer such a question? Yeah, when you, when you were uttering the question, it, it immediately like, in my brain immediately categorized it as a should X do Y question. Like it's should, <laughs> should we do this, right? Uh, it's a very common kind of strategy question. You are likely interviewing for PM2 or higher uh but uh but yeah there is there is a there is a set of things that you need to answer when you're thinking about should x do y uh like uh this is what i mean uh pm qu questions can appear very ambiguous very odd uh but when you when it boils down to it is actually a set of standardized questions mm. uh uh, like uh, this is a strategy question and uh, uh, there are five or six kind of strategy questions. Should X do Y? Uh, if you were X, what would you do? Um, which you, given between given an option between A and B, what should company do? What should company X do? Uh, there are just these four or five uh, sort of standardized questions. Again, these will become more and more obvious on how to answer when you do more mock interviews. Uh, the, the, uh, to answer your specific question, should X do Y, uh, is basically you need to look at uh, one, uh, what, are, what are the, like, there are these standard MBA frameworks, uh, uh, which come in handy, like uh, SWOT analysis. Is, is there an opportunity? Uh, is, is it in my strengths to do this? Or is there a competitor who's doing this and taking away market share from me? Uh, or is there is there a specific need for this in the market? Who's the cu customer? Who's the collaborator? Can I work with these vendors in order to make this happen? Does it make sense for the segment? Is this segment even my customer? Like there are so there are these like three or four potpourri of uh, you know 
uh, MBA frameworks like five C's, Porter's five forces, SWOT analysis, uh, and all of these kinds of stuff. You do a mix of these, uh, you will be able to arrive at an answer. Uh, and and again, like this is not a, the the key takeaway here is it's not a, it's not an unknown entity. It's actually a form of strategy question. And if you crack the framework for that strategic question type, uh, you will be able to answer this question very easily. I also want to just highlight one thing, which is uh, <coughs> I don't think they're looking for the answer. They're looking to understand your thought process. Your thought process, exactly. Uh, so I don't think the objective is to ultimately land at whether the question is, the answer is yes or no. Uh, what they want to see is uh, what data points would you use to even approach this question? Uh, how would you weigh the trade-offs? Uh, and ultimately, uh, if there were different constraints or different metrics that you were aiming for, how would you pick these trade-offs, right? Um, let's say if the uh, metric you're optimizing for is uh, attracting senior citizens because they're just not transacting on the platform, uh, the answer might be different than saying, um, uh, you know, if, you're, uh, if the objective is to uh, give discounts, uh, right? Or just increase the number of trips. So, the, the core goal they want to know is what are the questions you're going to ask? What is your thought process there? Uh, and it's not uh, bad to even ask for basic information from them, but they want to know what is the information you will look at, right? So you can ask for things like, why are we even doing this? What is the objective? If the objective is X, uh, how did we come up with this objective? Why is this objective even important? Uh, is this a good use of our resources? Can we be doing some other objective? Uh, things like that. But the point is uh, they want you to think, uh, they want you to articulate your thought process and they want to see that uh, in that thought process, uh, they can see a, uh, they can see a balanced point of view uh, that you're, you're going to approach it from a data perspective, not just your own personal bias, uh, that you're going to think hard about a problem and not just come to some conclusion saying, no, no, yes, you should go or no, you should not go. Right. Uh, that is what they are trying to see. Yeah. And, and also like uh, they're also in addition to whatever Muna mentioned, they're also looking for judgment, like in the absence of data, because you'd be surprised uh, how many experiments throw up inconclusive results uh, yes. in largest companies. And, and at that point, the only thing that you have to use is judgment. Uh, and they want to see like in the absence of data, yeah. are you able to apply structured judgment uh, and then say, you should do this, you should do yeah, this. Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, for all practical purposes, that is what a startup is, right? We don't have any data. Uh, we just have a problem statement. We understand the problem statement a little bit better. And we are we are using some hypothesis to test and validate whether these hypotheses are going to turn out to be true or not. And uh, yeah, just uh, I think the point is, uh, in the absence of all these things, how do you operate? In the presence of all these things, how do you operate? They want to see the difference in your thought process, right? So if you are a, if you are uh, working at a larger booking organization and they actually have lots of data for you to make this decision, are you just still basing it on random hypothesis or are you using data? So things like that. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question and then uh, we're already at uh, 9 p.m. So um, the question somebody asked was, uh, you know, when you... Um, how much, uh, Mayank has asked this question, later on with experience of, let's say, four or five years, do companies promote folks based on whether someone has an MBA degree or not? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The question is, uh, when you're at, let's say, an experience level of four or five years, do you need an MBA degree to get promoted? To get promoted? Yes. I don't think so. Uh, I've not seen an yeah, MBA I don't think so either. promotion at any company. Yeah. Uh, I definitely think that uh, with four to five years of experience, uh, actually the reliance on the effectiveness of your ability is way higher than MBA. Uh, one could argue that maybe when you're breaking in, an MBA can help you get a foot in the door. Uh, but once you already have experience, uh, your execution capability, your ability to launch great products, have good insights, have good taste, uh, definitely makes a much larger impact than any degree. Will. Yeah, the best uh, product managers I know don't have an MBA. Like, yes, uh, same. Same, same, same. Um, uh, last question, Saeed had a question. He's attending an interview with previous company. Uh, previous company I'm imagining means he's a company that he's already worked at. Uh, any points to consider? So uh, you'll have a lot of organizational context, which is very helpful. Uh, but at the same time, they should not let you bias uh, you in when you're answering this. You have to not work within the limits of the organization you have to show that you can actually think beyond the organization and and sort of show that you can take it to 10x 
uh, and I'm assuming you were working in a separate, in a different role uh, where you're work, uh, applying for a PM position. Uh, so you should not bring the biases of that, uh, you know, uh, that role. Like, uh, for example, mm. I've seen a lot of engineers get too stuck up on, uh, you know, uh, the technical details. Uh, mm. And, and uh, like for anyone who does that, I, I keep telling that my friend joined as an engineer at a company and he said, you know, in three companies, the amount of tech debt this company has, they're going to go, they're going to crash. And mm. the company he joined was Facebook. Uh, right. So, uh, so don't bring in those kinds of biases and you should be fine. There's a lot of um, organizational knowledge that you can bring, which would be very helpful for your yeah. uh, thing. But beyond that, I, I would need to know specifics in order to answer that question. Got it. Uh, cool. Uh, I think we're at... Uh... Uh, we're already at one person who has raised minutes. their hands. We can wrap up with them. Sucharita. Uh, yeah, she has. Uh, I'm just going to unmute her. Uh, so actually, I am from an engineering background. So I just wanted to know like, what, what kind of roles should I apply for? And like, how do I approach the interview? Uh, so like, I don't have previous product experience. I'm just trans transitioning from engineering to product I have personally seen that the best transitions from engineering to product actually happen within the same company. Uh, you have a lot of product context. You would have worked with product managers. You know the culture. You don't have to go through the entire interview group. Uh, you can actually exit a company with product management experience. Uh, for a lot of reasons, I recommend whenever there are engineers who come to me and say, I want to transition to product management, how do I interview? They, I tell them, Try making the shift within your own company, uh, run a project with your own PM, get your PM to endorse you for an APM program. Sometimes it may mean that you have to take a level down and go from like senior software engineer to uh, APM or PM1, but, but it's the price you pay. Uh, uh, so I would recommend that route. So don't interview outside, interview within the organization, go to a PM role in the organization that you're in. Yes. And if that doesn't work, then this is a shameless plug. Uh, you can come to a priest. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yes, uh, I think internal transitions are the best. Uh, but they're not always possible. I know that. Uh, I think few people get lucky to be in an environment where you're considered for a different role as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one uh, thing, one advice I have for everybody that's looking to transition to product, whether you officially transition or you don't officially transition, you should start behaving like you're a product manager. You should start working like you're a product manager. Uh, start contributing in your current org uh, like a product manager without having, um, uh, without uh, feeling like without that title, I can't contribute, right? Uh, so when you go above and beyond, you take that extra mile, people see the effort and then they appreciate. And that's a great way to learn. That's a great way to get endorsement. That's a great way to uh, get that word of confidence. Uh, yes, I know, Suchirita, you are, you're already mm -hmm. at a place. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, I think uh, we've answered uh, pretty much all questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gokul, for taking time out. Um, there was one last question that I'm going to try to get through because uh, you are specifically uniquely positioned to answer that question, uh, which is uh, Snehal had the question on how do you get selected for an international APM program? What factors affect your uh, selection? Right. Uh, I think we had a conversation earlier around moving yes. abroad as a PM. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to reiterate whatever I mentioned there. Uh, I think trying to move internationally for an APM role is, is a challenge. Uh, because yes. when companies hire you for international roles, uh, they are, they are more, than, more likely going to hire you for experience, for the expertise that you bring. And when you, when you are senior, it, the transition becomes very, very easy. Yeah. Uh, because it's very, very... Now I see how expensive it is for a company to hire someone uh, yes. internationally. Uh, it's not cheap and a company just doesn't have the incentive to do that for, for an APM uh, to take a chance on them. Some companies like Google and all of these do, uh, but it's incredibly rare. Uh, so if like international plans are on your horizon, uh, I would recommend like go to APM, go to PM, like, build like three, four years of experience and then make the deep. Uh, that, that's probably like a way more uh, advantageous leap for you as well, because uh, don't forget one thing, uh, especially in Europe, uh, I, I don't say it's the case in US, uh, lower level PM salaries are very low, very, very yes. low. Uh, yes. And only when you get to senior levels, even at senior levels, uh, I, I I probably make like 60% of what I would do in India, but, but it's still like very high 
within Germany, within Berlin. Um, and this is possible only because I came in as a senior hire. Yes. Um, and, and I recommend the same path for you. Yeah, I actually want to harp on that a little bit. I think a lot of people have a misnomer that uh, international jobs pay you better. Uh, not all international jobs pay you better. Pay you uh, better. Mm-hmm. Also, not all international regions pay you better. Uh, and uh, that is definitely true. For example, uh, if you look at uh, Indonesia, you look at uh, Middle East, you look at uh, Europe, um, maybe it's slightly higher in the US, but also the cost of I living is much higher. Is very well, Mona. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Middle East, the, the you know, for the APM level again is... Ah, uh, APM, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm talking about, yeah. yeah. When I was yeah, like, yeah. you remember the conversation we had. Yes, like, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So I think that is that is a challenge. Uh, and a lot of people uh, in their first, second jobs, when they want to go abroad, they think it's going to be a better life because they're going to get paid better, so on and so forth. Um, there's a trade-off. Um, and I definitely think at least in the last year, uh, India, definitely salary buckets have gone through the roof. Uh, you get paid way better in India than you get paid outside. Yeah. So if uh, pay is one of your key criteria, you should be mindful that not all regions pay you as well and not all, at least. Actually, I don't think any pay. region pays as well as India today. I just did for purchasing court. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so. Cool. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've been asking questions, uh, but I think now there's Santosh and Vedang that have uh, put their raised their hands. If you have two more minutes, I'll I'll try to exactly unmute. two more minutes. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, I'll I'll un- unmute Santosh, and that'll be the last question. Hi, Santosh. Hi, hi everyone. So my doubt is that like uh, for a person without a PM role, like uh, does MBA have a plus point? If it is, but in this market, I'm not able to get shortlisted like i have let's say we have uh, the confidence part after getting shortlisted performance but shortlisting is the major crunch and like bottleneck so how do one cross that bottleneck there are there okay. are two ways to do this one i think uh, uh, referrals work 10x better than direct applications uh, and uh, cold reach outs work uh, when i was transitioning from a founder role to a PM role. I was a middling startup founder. I was not a successful startup founder. I didn't have an MBA. I had a five point GPA, uh, right? Uh, five out of 10, right? Uh, and um, uh, my only advantage was uh, uh, I could position myself as someone who had done product, which was true. Uh, but also that uh, I reached out to a ton of people on Twitter, uh, all very senior folks, like Shashank Mehta, uh, who, was, who was employee number seven at RazorPay, who is a very good friend of mine today. And I basically asked these people for advice. And when I went and spoke to them, they realized, yeah, you know what? This guy actually can decently do product, I think. And Mm -hmm. then they opened up doors for me. Um, And so like you just have to knock on doors hard enough till they open, number one. Uh, But an MBA is a good way to uh, get a foot in the door. Like I know people who historically have had non-tech, non-product kind of roles. And then they went and did an MBA and then they used the MBA to step into uh, product management uh, kind of roles. And it's, it's a legit path. Uh, but I think the better way is to like sort of like show your high agency by actually going and talking to like CPOs and say uh, like going and talking to people like Mona who are in a position to sort of uh, help you. Uh, I, I think that'd be my approach. So knock on doors till they open and or do an MBA. And uh, uh, yeah, Sashan, uh, so you, you want to unmute Santosh and I, I will take Vedang's question. I don't want to let him ha- hang it. Back. Okay, Santosh. No, I just wanted to say, like, I have finished my MBA, but I still face problem in this conversion, like getting my audition shortlisted. Knock, so knock, knock the... enough doors, knock enough doors, slide into DMs, uh, slide into LinkedIn conversations. There's no shame. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. All right. Last question, guys. We can't keep doing this. Uh, Google mm-hmm. has been very, very kind with this time. Uh, Vidang. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Shravani. Thanks a lot. But, uh, thanks a lot. I, I was feeling left out. Exactly what Gokul mm-hmm. said. Yeah. So basically, my question is, there are lots of times when people ask you questions, which are which is the biggest problem in their company. Like, for example, phone pay. I gave an interview. You asked me, give me give me a way where, how, how, <coughs> how a vendor will... In, how I can ensure somebody puts my QR code on his shop at all times and doesn't doesn't bring in a competitor, right? Like for example, he's he's basically asked he basically asked me to create a product which which has a very high moat, right? Not do something like Bharat Pay which gives you loans or something like that, but basically something with which which I know he doesn't have an answer to, right? And obviously I also don't have an answer to, but like it's it's an it's a question which just 
right so how do, how do I, how do we handle that yeah i get your question uh, i think the answer is uh, you they are not looking for the right answer they are looking for whether you can think through these hard problems and arrive at a structured way of answering them like would you look at uh, what the uh, current competitive landscape is how competitors uh, uh you know charge these merchants what incentives that the, does the merchant have to display a qr code uh, like these kinds of levers that you can pull in order to make sure that uh, the competitor uh, the shopkeeper does it it's not to say like this give me a silver bullet that will work it's up it's to say uh, it's to see whether you are able to actually think through the problem space and in a structured way in that 20 minute uh, space uh, so they're not testing you on the answer they're testing you on the structure oh great thanks Cool. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining in. And uh, yeah, really you know, sorry, Shravani. I, I wish I could take your question, uh, but I really have to go. I'm, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Gokul. You don't have to be sorry. You've been really kind. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining in and uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys at the next event. Uh, there's a link if you guys want to do mock interviews with Gokul, you guys can book it. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, there's no shortcut to cracking interviews. You have to practice, practice, practice. Um, and uh, do that. And I'm pretty sure you guys will uh, show up on the other side more successful. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.